let's see now. We stayed, we stayed up in, uh, in, uh, our unit stayed there in Paris for quite a while, and then we moved on up to a town called Mormelon, just out of Reims. Okay, getting and closer to Belgium? Yeah, we were getting, well, we went, we had supplies uh, in Belgium and all over. But this was up, uh, well, it'd be further toward Patton's army, because he was going from Paris up like to Reims, then to Nancy, and then you, you get up in, into Germany, and you'd be on the Rhine River at Bonn and Frankfurt and Cologne, all the way up to where I ended up. Okay, in southern Germany, yeah. coming across southern then, Germany. Then you went all the way up, because uh, I was in Switzerland and Austria, the whole works. So now, my, I've been led to believe that Paris itself didn't get the kind of destruction that places like London and so forth had. Is that, is that accurate? No, not Paris, no, Paris didn't get anything that I saw. But after you got out of France and went up through Germany after I'll tell you, you could get travel with main routes and the planes just took care of every factory, everything there were and only would leave the roads good. Oh. The Germans, oh man, it was just something. So I got pictures of all that too. So our bombing runs left the roads reasonably intact for you to move on? Yeah, for the troops to go on up and all that. Okay. And there, I, I could take pictures and put in all those towns where they but but they would leave all the breweries and everything. <laughs> you can't believe how they had all that marked. You so wonder. They had good intelligence. Uh, <laughs> but uh, let's see, get back on the better stop one minute here and we'll see. They Patton's army had what did they so shot up and all that up there. Mm -hmm. And that was up around Nancy there. Mm -hmm. And so then I got a call to Take, we had this whole weapons carrier full of narcotics I had to deliver from our, our supply depot there in Reims. We'd moved up that far bringing stuff from Paris up to there, you know, to, right. to have it closer. And then I took a sergeant with me. Cause every time we took those loads, I had to go and have it signed out. Oh, sure. You couldn't just turn it over to anybody. No, you couldn't. And so I went up to Nancy and and we um, we had a hard time getting up there on the main road like that because there were so many tanks and stuff more being sent up there to Patton to uh, because he needed more help. Right. And they were even though that uh, big hospital there in Nancy had the Red Crosses on them, they were hitting that. The Germans were hitting that. And they weren't supposed to. Right. So we went right direct to that hospital with this load of supplies. And I went in there and got that all taken care of and signed out. And they, I happened to know a, a doctor there that was, or one of the fellows that was in officer school with me and ran into him and he took me through there. And this was a place like we'd say St. Mary's about six floors and, and every aisle on every floor with lined with litters on both sides with injured uh, troops, you know, soldiers. Yeah, just the, uh, the the canvas canvas shops. things they take them on just like a cot, you know. Right. And they were just solid, just every hallway waiting to be operated on or be taken care of. And, and so then we didn't get back uh, into Reims there until about two days later because they wouldn't let you go back because they were bringing so much more equipment up. And the, and the traffic, they'd rather not have anybody going back until they got all these other tanks and stuff. Okay. Yeah. No two-lane traffic. <laughs> yeah, they'd rather have, you know, they needed more help. And that's when they really got blasted up there when Patton had the worst deal. Yeah. yeah. So I was there then, and then after that I set up things on the Rhine River. 
Detroit, and I went down at Frankfurt and Bonn and started there, and, and I would take units of about ten men and one officer, you know, to handle things in that area, and then move on and set up another one. And then I went on up and finally set up our last one up at uh, Rheinberg. That's bring her up to Hamburg. Oh, okay. Oh, that's up close to the Baltic. So that's about when it all ended. Right. See, that's where I was when when they got the Russians and the Germans, uh, or Russians and the Americans together and getting ready to sign the treaty. Now, were you, uh, as you're running into that in the spring of 45 and working your way up, did you have the feeling that it's just a matter of days, weeks, months, or, oh. or did just how how well informed were you guys about that? Well, we knew it was going to get pretty close to being the end of it. Because even when I got up to, um, like, uh, Rheinberg there, yeah. we had supplies up there, and we had troops up there, and, and you had more and more prisoners, just stockades and stockades of the prisoners. And they were glad to not get killed. They were happy to be captured. Yeah. yeah. And even up there in those towns, why the Americans were starting to take things out of stores and stuff. They were, they were all, well, the place we stayed, when, when I got up there, we could just pick a place we wanted because the people were moving out because they'd just been bombarded. and. The Germans uh, in this house we took over, it was a doctor's house, and I only had these 12 men and myself, or 10, and uh, so we didn't even go and eat with the, with all the, you know, the comp or the battalions and stuff, because they just supplied us with what we needed there, and we'd eat there and draw rations, because we knew we weren't going to be there too long. We, and. We we're just uh, taking care of more prisoners of war than anything else with medical supplies. Oh. You know, because we weren't getting many of ours. We were just going to take care of that until it was signed. We had no rehab, so that's what we did. Okay. And, and then uh, we, I went upstairs there in that house when we looked it over to see if it would take care of all this was a big house and the farmer, or this doctor, he had a farm and moved out to there and he also right across the road had a uh, little cottage that was right on the Rhine River. Huh. And, and he, they had to build a, one of these bridges out of Air Force strips across the Rhine River right there because it was blowing up. Oh, okay, one of these temporary bridges. Yeah, so I went across that one day, and that's how safe it was then. You could get down there then. And um, so then... Still working? Got, got ready to move out of there. We just got called back, you know, and troops stayed there. Yeah. But they had these... Um, Oh, fenced in places that would be maybe a mile every direction around it where they put those prisoners. Oh, and okay. then they had to each, I had to go out once or twice and walk around that and then they would have guards up there, you know, every so often up high on a platform to watch them. Right. And oh, it was just terrible. They had just latrines built there where they had to go to the toilet. And, Nothing sanitary at all. Prisoners are just out in the open, basically. Right in the open. Oh, okay. And I don't know how they could ever, you know, live through that very long. But it was because they captured so many, they had to have something to put them and take yeah. care of them until they shipped them someplace. And that's why we had uh, supply units up there too to have stuff to keep them from dying. Yeah. But they were there by the thousands, and you could go up there. And and we, we had to check the guards up there to be sure they wouldn't fall asleep. And on each one of those, maybe eight or ten of those around that place. So one night, uh, every so often, we'd take turns and walk around that. That's kind of an eerie feeling. Yeah, because it probably wasn't well lit. 
No, it didn't they have, have lights. lights or stuff. Just lights up there, spotted out onto there. Then you climb up there and take a check of them. Uh, was it your impression in Germany itself that the uh, average civilian person in Germany, that their, their general existence and lifestyle and so forth, uh, by the end of the war, that it had been seriously affected too? Shortages uh, and stuff like that? When, so many of those Germans that we saw, even with the ones we captured and had in England, they were so happy to be done with it and really didn't want to, even some of those real tough soldiers that we had of theirs, boy, you couldn't believe how they worked for you. You could trust them and everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they had had enough. So their loyalty to the to the Nazi uh, groups and to the Fuhrer and so forth was, was skin deep? Yeah. You'd find some once in a while that you know, would want to be dirty to you or something, and they would just, once in a while, they'd be one of those real tough ones, you know, and what they would do with them, I'll tell you, to be honest, they'd just take them out by the stockade and build a pen right in front of where the rest of them are marched in and out of work, and just leave them staying there in the hot sun all day. Uh -huh. And they, that kind of, I don't know, must make them think that, you can't do that stuff, you know. I'd say one of them would spit at one of our officers or something, you know. Yeah. And I, I saw this happen that one of those Germans spit at one of our officers, and he just took, I mean, one of our guards that watched them back and forth to where they were, he just put that butt of his gun right in his face. Stuff like that. You see a little that. Right. It's yeah. It's a little bit tough to hold. Everything People accountable back. to everything when you're yeah. in that situation. So, um, let me just kind of pick up a few loose ends here. Uh, in terms of morale, uh, between training back in the states, uh, preparation before D-Day, uh, the period of time from when you landed in France until you you got to uh, about the end of the thing in Germany. Um, was morale significantly different in any of those points? No, I. it just seemed like all the time you knew you were going to go someplace and do something. And the further you advanced, everybody seemed to, we all had good morale, I'd say, because we knew our men so well, be, you know, as a small group. Right. And they were all together, everything we did and all that. And and even to the point where if some of them got in trouble, if they worked for me, and oh, I can remember one little incident that didn't amount to that much, but our CO, he was one of those guys, he wouldn't give an inch, you know. And they wanted to go into town one day and they took a truck, they were truck drivers, okay. and they wanted to drive into Taunton. And they got picked up by the MPs. And they were both staff sergeants, and he broke them. And I knew their wives, Alan did too, because we were together there. There was several months, and, and we do stuff with those. They played ball, some of them. And, and then I had to write to those uh, wives of them and tell them what happened, and that they weren't getting the same pay either. Then. Oh yeah. So then, when when I when 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 uh, the war ended, and then. I was back at Reims, and I went in to Reims the day they signed all the papers for the capitulation, and, and even got this little ashtray they made out a couple days later. It didn't take them long to get that stuff out, and they got one for me, and I have that. And, okay. and then I I went to the when they were going to wait now for uh, everybody uh, to. Uh, Troops had to stay there, and, and they sent me to the University of Paris, and being a, a special service officer, and was going to keep me there. And I would have been able to have Helen come over and help uh, with sports, and try, you know, to get them all rehabilitated. And okay. During the occupation. Yeah, it happened to be that the 
fellow that was running it was the athletic director that was at the University of Minnesota when I was there. Okay. So then after I got through this course and everything, uh, they were going to promote me to a major. I was a captain and stay there and be on his staff at the University of Paris for help and train. And I went back with this letter to my CO and I had 10 points more than he did because of having a child and he didn't have any family. And he went into Paris and got his orders to go home and turn over the whole supply depot to me as commander. So oh. I couldn't take that other job. Oh, okay. So then I had to wait until a new unit came in, which would be, oh, let's see, I got into an awful close up to around Thanksgiving. A 45. Yeah, because I was in charge of all that then, and this was kind of unusual. I, we were still supplying, uh, like people going home, like not far from us was this nurses uh, where they shipped them out, all the gals mm -hmm. out separate, and. Uh, I knew two gals that used to, when I worked at Weber and Judd across from St. Mary's back in 40 and 42 there, Yeah. that always came in the store before they went over to work and they didn't have a pharmacy at St. Mary's then. So we were supplying all the prescriptions for St. Mary's and it was just funny, I got to know them so well over the years I ran that and we were, I was taking a load of supplies over to this uh, place where they were going to be sent home. And walking down the street, I saw those two gals. They were always together. And I, that was two years later. I told the sergeant, stop. And so he stopped, and I went over and talked to him. And I said, how's things going? Oh, the food was so terrible there at that place. Well, see, this was where I had gone back to, uh, to Marmalon, where we had our last place there out of Reims. Okay. And we had our own mess hall and, uh, for the officers there and out of this old hotel we had. So I says, we'll pick you up and you can come over and eat with us, because they were officers, you know, and by gosh, that was the funniest thing ever. And so then they were ready to go home. And it was uh, funny then, when, when I came home, I was, uh, should I go on with all this now to finish this? Just yeah, wrap up getting home, sure. Yeah. So then, so then I was still on Reams, and we were uh, going to go to uh, back through the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. and let's like, see the big port we were at. But so they had a, a troop train going to take all the men from from Marmalon and Reams there. That area is about five miles apart. And it would take two days and two nights on that troop train, so I was assigned to be in charge of the troop train. <laughs> and so I had to ride in a box car with all the luggage. And then they had cars with the people that, you know, were just the regular passengers and troops. And so then, uh, let's see, what's that big one? Well, Marseille is one Marseille, of the places. That's where it was. Okay. So I'm thinking of all these towns in France and everything. So we got into Marseille and two days later and one of the officers that was up in the, in the, uh, with the troops, you know, he, he, he just lost it. He was just going kind of crazy. And so when they stopped the train once and one of the officers up there said, what should we do to, for him? And, well, I said, I just happened to know that fellow. He's from Minneapolis. And he was one of the guys that I'd met. And it's just funny how he worked in a meat market uh, for a fellow that used to have a meat market in West Concord. Oh. So I said, I'll take care of him. You bring him back here. And we, he'd look out the boxcar and he'd say, you know, the smoke from the train would leave a cloud or something. He'd say, look at those people up there, and all that stuff. Right. So then I we, we got into this uh, place at uh, Mormelon, and they came and picked us up with big trucks, and it was cold, it was freezing that night. And, and so we uh, uh, were 
drove up. I rode in the front with this, this, this uh, black truck driver. And we got back to the barracks where we were supposed to put all this luggage. And he tried about six, seven times to back that big semi thing up there. And finally, I said, uh, I, I said I taught this in the states. And I said, get over and I'll put her in there. And I backed her and put her right that door the first time. And all these people, officers and stuff out there, waiting for us to come. Clapped and <laughs> <laughs> what's going on? <coughs> so we we had to stay there though about three weeks because the storms were so bad. And so every night when we think it's going to be good to go home, we'd um, have to get everybody out and, and check their luggage. Well, then I was in charge of checking the luggage because it was all the people that was on that train, and we had about three priests with us. And they, you could take one gun with you, everybody, but no liquor. Yeah. <laughs> they had their fags, each one of them just solid with the liqueurs, stuff they'd picked up all through France there that they wanted to take home. The priests? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I said, no, you can't take it. The next, I said, just get rid of it. The next day, they'd have that bags out there, and same thing. They were not going to, they thought eventually they were going to get rid of it, you know, take it home. So finally, we got together and we just told them that there, some other officers said, don't use bringing that out anymore because we're not going to monkey with it any longer. That, that night they took it into the barracks and distributed it to all the officers. Party time. <laughs> yeah, oh man. And they, uh, they, you can't believe, it was just funny. But they could take their guns home. Well then finally we got our orders to go and we uh, went to through the strait, uh, Gibraltar there, and, and we hit the worst storm. And they even one fellow on our boat got washed over dumping garbage and stuff like that. They can't even go back and look for him. Right. And then we got home in about 10, 11 days again, and uh, they try to fix the officers up so they'll have a tough time going home. So they assigned all of us to those hammocks. Uh, you know, in, like the Navy guys have, yeah, sleeping, where, yeah. where you just swing back and forth and all that. And so I was assigned to one, and I just got on the boat. And my name was called, and I thought, "What's going on?" You know, and I went there, and they didn't have a pharmacist for the doctors at the dispensary on the ship. Yeah, on the ship, and I was got a stateroom, <laughs> and it was a pharmacist on the way home, then with the medicine stuff they had on the boat. <laughs> so then that was pretty good. Then when I got in, uh, we landed in Boston on the, about the 23rd of December. Okay. And we got, uh, I had to be in charge of all the men on that troop train then going to Camp McCoy. In Wisconsin. Yeah. You know, that whole train was going to Camp McCoy. You know all the troops that were on that. They had that figured all out, you know. So, so then we, I had all their records in mine, and we got to uh, Chicago on Christmas Eve. Every guy that I had all the records for jumped the train at the depot in Chicago, and I had all their records because the train was going to go on to McCoy and well, my own. <laughs> Whether they're honored or not. Yeah, because <coughs> they wanted to get home. Yeah. Otherwise, if they went into Camp McCoy, they'd have to get mustered out and it'd take four or five days for some of them. And they wanted to be home Christmas. Mm -hmm. So then when I took all the records into them, it was snowing that day and that was Christmas Day then. It was, it was Christmas Eve when we were in, in the depot down there. Mm -hmm. And so then I, I thought, well heck, I don't want to get I told him I don't want to get. I want to go home too, and I'll keep my records that I was an officer. And so I took mine home with me, and I hitchhiked to Winona and took the train to Rochester, and then I got um, hold of Helen. She was out at a farm where it was out of Wisconsin, there with relatives, and 
Chin or Dad came and picked me up, but then that's the first time I saw Tom or saw him. So you got home technically on Christmas on Day Christmas. in 1945. Yeah. Okay.